waters, God of the sky, God in the morning, God in the night, God of the desert, God of the rain, God in the busy, God in the mundane, God of the mountain, God of the plains, God in the laughter, God in the pain. He's God of the promise. What he says remains true. He does what he's promised for me and for you. Since the beginning of time, God has been pursuing mankind. His pursuit is steadfast and unwavering. His love is resolute and unmatched. From the moment of our first breath, we have all been searching for hope. In every human heart, there is a longing for true purpose and meaning. There is a sense that we were meant for more. Our city is filled with people searching for truth, searching for answers. These answers can't be found in quick fixes, self-help books, or our limited ability to understand the meaning of life. Eternity is within us. The kingdom of God isn't a place, it's a people who are pursued by their creator and are found in the midst of their searching. You see, where the pursuit of God and the searching of mankind collide, there is Jesus. The bridge to the one true God, Jesus. The beginning and the end, Jesus. The perfect example of perfect love, Jesus. The one who loves us in spite of our failures, takes our worst and gives us his best, Jesus. The way, the truth, and the life, the one who broke the chains of our sin, the one who has the power to heal and restore, the one who defeated death and rose victorious on the third day, Jesus. No other name is higher, no other name is greater, no other name than the one we celebrate today, Jesus. Welcome in, welcome in, and I want to welcome you to the City of Brotherly Love this afternoon. The, the, the City of Brotherly Love, we're in the Church of Philadelphia here. And the real Philadelphia that we're talking about here in Revelation chapter 3 was started by a king who built a city for his brother. And we derive the word from two words, philos, which means loving, and adelphos, which means brother. So if we pick up in chapter 3, it says, And to the angel of the church in Philadelphia write, These things say, He who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David, he who opens and none shall shut, who shuts and none opens. We've got to understand that our God is a holy, all right? Is our God holy? Amen. We can all agree that our God is holy because we see here, he who is holy, right? The holy one. The holy one is a title of God, amen? And he's regularly called the holy one of Israel. So like we read in the book of Isaiah, Chapter 12, verse 6, it refers to his unique distinctiveness, his otherness, distinctive in essence and in total purity, because he begins and it shows that he dwells in total light, in complete holiness and greatness, and no one can compare to our God. I don't know. I don't care what anybody says. I don't care what the Muslims say. I don't care what the Buddhists say. I don't care what the Hinduists say. I don't care what any other religion says. They don't have a God, a creator, that involves itself with the creation. This is the only religion, the only relationship where the God of creation actually relates with its creation, right? So we have a creator that wants to reenact with us as his creation. So there's no one that can compare to our God. Amen. But you know what else? He's true, right? Our God's true. 
In 1 John chapter 5, verse 20, God is called him who is what? True, right? And here the description is applied to who? It's, it's, it's applied to Jesus Christ, the Messiah. And in Revelation chapter 6, verse 10, which we're going to see, our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ is called the holy and true, as here the sense of true is that he is real and reliable and the source of truth. Everything he has said and done is true. You can ca take that check and take it right to the bank because it's going to cash. A lot of times in your smaller communities, especially farming communities, you'll hear the phrase, you can bet the farm on it, right? You can bet the farm on it. And the reason they say that is because it's guaranteed, right? So we know that everything that God has done and said is true. It's the finality. It's the finished work of Jesus Christ. Amen. It says, he who has the key of David, he who opens and none shall shut, who shuts and none shall open. Did you know that this is a picture taken from the Old Testament? Does anybody know where this is taken from in the Old Testament? This is why I tell you guys all the time that you have to believe and understand the Old Testament in order to understand the rest of Scripture. Because this here where it says, He who has the key of David, he who opens and none shall shut, who shuts and none shall open, is a picture taken from Isaiah chapter 22, verses through 25. So Isaiah 22 verses 20 through 25. It says there in the days of Hezekiah, the key of David is to be given to Eli El Eliakim, who will replace the false chief steward of the royal palace, the treasurer over the king's treasury, and he will be a father to the inhabitants of Jerusalem and to the house of Judah. And the key of the house of David will I lay on his shoulder, and he shall open and none shall shut, and he shall shut and none shall open. Elikim was a faithful steward who managed his stewardship well and was seen as a father to the people. Now, I want you to take note of something here because it's very, very important that you take note of this, that in all of this is that this steward was in charge of granting people access to the king. If you look at Isaiah 22, you're going to see that this steward was the access point for allowing people to come in and see the king. It was the granting of the steward to allow them to enter into the gates. Ain't that amazing? And you're probably thinking right now, well, pastor, where are you going with this? And I want you to understand that everything in the New Testament is going to confirm what's in the Old Testament. Okay. The Old Testament is proclaiming the coming of Christ. The New Testament is the confirmation of those proclamations. Okay. So here, what we're going to see is that our Lord Jesus is a type of Elohim and that he is the one who grants access to the Father. So Isaiah 22 here is now being displayed in the book of Revelation to give the Jews, because remember, this is, this is a Hebrew book. It's a, it's a declaration and an understanding of who Jesus Christ is. The book of Revelation is a revealing of who Jesus is. So they ha it has to go back to the Old Testament to prove to them who Jesus Christ really is. Amen. This is absolutely amazing because now it's showing Jesus as the one who grants access to Father God. He's a type of Elohim. It's important at this point to bring up an important issue, and that is that this is an apostolic secession. This is an apostolic secession. And you're thinking, whoa, what are you talking about, Pastor Nate? Flip with me to Matthew, Matthew chapter 16, if you would. Flip with me to Matthew chapter 16, because I want you to see this with your own eyes. I don't want you just listening to me. I want you digging into the word. This is how we learn. This is how we grow. This is how you hold me accountable to what I'm teaching. Amen. So go to Matthew chapter 16. We're going to pick up in verse 13, Matthew 16, picking up in 13. It says, when Jesus came into the region of uh, Caesarea Philippi, he asked his disciples saying, who do men say that I the son of man am. So they said, some say John the Baptist, some say Elijah and others, Jeremiah or one of the prophets. He said to them, but who do you say that I am? Simon Peter answered and said, you are the Christ, the son of the living God. 
Jesus answered and said to him, Blessed are you, Simon Barjona, for flesh and blood has not revealed this to you, but my Father who is in heaven. And I also say to you that you are Peter, and on this rock I will build my church, and the gates of Hades shall not prevail against it. And I will give you the keys of the kingdom of heaven, and whatever you bind on earth will be bound in heaven, and whatever you loose on earth will be loosed in heaven. Then he commanded his disciples that they should tell no one that he was Jesus the Christ. So from these passages here, it would at first seem like our Lord Jesus handed the leadership of the church to Peter. Can we all agree on that? That, that Jesus gave Peter the, the reign of the church. Is that what happened here? If you look at this, if you just glance at it, is that what you think happened here? And then before his death, he would pass on to another person and then to another person and to another person so it would be handed down. It sort of sounds like the Catholic Church by the secession and the, the progression of, of their pope because they say that Peter was the first pope of the Catholic Church and it's been handed down. The keys have been handed down one thing at a time, right? One person at a time. I'm going to tell you this cannot be true. This cannot be true and I'm going to explain why, Okay. I'm going to explain why so that you guys can understand why I say that this can't be true. The first church leader was not Peter. Okay? It was it was our Lord's half brother James. In addition, Peter did not hand off the leadership mantle to another. Based on the church traditions, others are as we see are cardinals vote in the next leader. And the final unaliver to this false premise is that our Lord Jesus spoke to Peter around 32 AD. And as you know, the Apostle John wrote the book of Revelation around 96 AD. And as and please note, the keys are back in our Lord's hand in Revelation chapter 3, verse 7. And he says, these things say, he who is holy, he who is true, he who has the key of David. So what does it mean regarding our Lord Jesus' comment to Peter? What does it mean when Jesus makes this comment to Peter? Does anybody know what Peter is called? What did what did Peter what did Jesus call Peter in Greek? Anybody? What is the rock in in Greek? It's Petros, right? P E T R O S. Now I want you to understand something here that Petros in Greek literally means a large piece of rock. It means a large piece of rock. But I want to show you something because when it says in there upon this rock, right? Remember the scripture says upon this rock, Jesus is called Petra, P-E-T-R-A, Petra. And that means upon this rock. And that's a huge rock like Gibraltar. So the whole scripture here is talking about our Lord Jesus' comment to Peter regarding his confession that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that Jesus alone has the keys of the afterworld and death. This would stress that he has power over the grave and can release or retain whom he will. If he opens, none can shut. If he shuts, none can open. So the church of Philadelphia are called on to recognize that as the greater David, he controls the afterlife and the death, releasing whom he will, and that he can provide or refuse access to the new Jerusalem. This is astounding information. Everybody's trying to tell you from all these other religions and other denominations that there's multiple ways to get to heaven. But in Matthew, Jesus, out of his own words, says there's only one way to get there. That he's the one that grants access. That he can provide or refuse access to the new Jerusalem. Your good works, your good deeds, nothing you think that you've done will qualify you. The only thing that will qualify you is Jesus Christ. Amen. It says, I know your works. Behold, I have set before you an open door which none can shut, that you have a little power and have kept my word and did not deny my name. The reference to the open door
clearly refers back in some way to the previous reference to the key and demonstrates that our Lord Jesus also controls the opportunities of witness and service, such as we read in, 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 in several scriptures. And I'm going to give you some of them scriptures. It's not your witness. It's not your service. So many people walking around, look at my ministry, look at my witness, look at my testimony, look at my, 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 right? It's the me, 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 the I, I, I game. None of this has anything to do with you, period. It has everything to do with the Holy Spirit operating through you. You should receive no recognition, but, the, but God should receive all recognition. Man has put himself on the pedestal and removed God from the pedestal. They've almost put, have you, if you're like cooking, and when you're cooking that main thing, it's on the front burner, and you move it to the back burner to keep it warm while you cook something else on the front burner. People have put themselves on the front burner and moved God to the back burner. Look at what 1 Corinthians 16, 9 says. It says, for a great and effective door has opened to me and there are many adversaries. Look at what Paul says in 2 Corinthians 2 and 12. He says, furthermore, when I came to Troas to preach Christ's gospel and a door was open to me. It doesn't say it was opened by him. It said it was opened to me by the Lord. The Lord opened that door. Amen. Look at what Colossians 4, 3 says. It says, meanwhile, praying also for us that God would open to us a door for the word to speak the mystery of Christ for which I am also in chains. Do you see a, 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 a sequence of things taking place here? It was nothing that Paul was doing. He was giving all the credit to God. He says, for which I am also in change. He says that God would open to us a door for the word. Come on. It's clear that the works of the Philadelphians include faithful witness. They're not a powerful church, but they're a faithful church. They have held on to and obeyed the teaching of our master, Lord Jesus. They've been true to him and have not denied his name. Nothing, in fact, is actually said against them. <clears throat> Except perhaps their need to experience more of the power of the Spirit. Isn't that the truth? The open door and the reference to he who opens and none shuts parallels with the time of Hezekiah in 2 Chronicles chapter 29, verse 3. When as Israel perished, Judah witnessed a revival characterized by the reopening of the doors of the temple when they had previously been closed. And in Hezekiah's time was the time of the open door. But eventually that door closed through the failure of the people. He says, Behold, I give to you the synagogue of Satan, of those who say they are Jews, but are not do lie. Behold, I will make them to come and worship before your feet and to know that I have loved you. Once again, we have reference to those Jews who deliberately sought to cause trouble with the authorities for the Christian church. Isn't it amazing that the ones who truly love the same God, Jehovah Elion, the Lord Most High, gets the most resistance from them? Though they claim to be Jews, says our Lord Jesus, they're not really true Jews, for they do not obey the law or show mercy. Has anybody in here seen that firsthand? Because I have. Has anybody seen that? Has anybody seen that through a Messianic Jew, maybe? We've got to start to understand that when they're doing this, they don't have the proper love for Adonai Yahweh. As he requires, they're simply liars like their father, Satan. Amen. Who is the chief adversary? They demonstrate that really they belong to his synagogue and not God's. 
but one day they'll be made to acknowledge their area. In the words of Isaiah 60, 14, it says, the sons of those who afflicted you will come bending to you, and all those who despised you will bow themselves down at the soles of your feet, and they will call you the city of the Lord, the Zion of the Holy One of Israel, and they will enter the gates which are open continually. So these false Jews will have to admit that these Christians whom they hate and despise are the true children of the one who is holy. These fake Jews are going to have to come to the feet of the Christian believer, the born again believer in the millennial reign, and they're going to have to bow at their feet. (coughs) He says, because you kept my word of patient endurance. I also will keep you from the hour of trial, which is to come upon the whole world to try those who dwell on earth. I come quickly, hold fast what you have that no man may take your crown. Please take note of this statement for his word of patient endurance. All who would live godly in Christ Jesus is going to suffer persecution. Do you understand that persecution has been around since the beginning and it's going to continue till the end. Even the disciples suffered persecution. Remember what Apostle Paul said in his second his letter of Second Timothy chapter three, verse twelve. He says, and we've got to understand that clearly the Philadelphia church has also faced persecution instigated by false Jews. And they've come through unscathed, patiently enduring. But there's some good words here. There's some good words here, some good words for for growth and for edification and for hope. There's words of hope here. Because he says, I also will keep you from the hour of trial. There's a play on the word keep. You have kept my word of patience, endurance. I will keep you from the hour of trial. So God responds to the faithfulness of his people. They've already suffered enough. He's not going to ask them to suffer more. It says those who dwell on earth are mentioned regularly in Revelation, referring specifically to what? It's not talking about Christians. It's talking about non-Christians. And the various trials that they have to go through and vividly described, they represent humanity outside of the church. This is a declaration of the humanity outside of the church. It has nothing to do with the born-again believer. So the Philadelphians are promised that in some way, not described, they're going to escape not all the trials, but the worst of trials to come, the hour of trial. This may be in mind that as always in such times, there'll be places where the worst effects are not felt, possibly because of the presence of a humane governor. And it's a reminder that God can keep his people either from or through, depending on his will, any hour or trial they have to face. But it's more probable that it has in mind the particularly awful attacks of spiritual forces, which are limited in time, but which those sealed by God will not experience. Who in here believes in the rapture? Come on, who in here believes in the rapture? Who believes that God's going to deliver you from that hour? Who believes that God is going to save you from that deep depth of punishment that's coming across the world? Because this is important. Because you're not going to be kept from everything that the world's going to face right now in Philadelphia, okay? If you go to Philadelphia, Pennsylvania, right now they've experienced one of the worst winters. This was last year that they experienced one of the worst winters. It was experienced all over the country. But there they had negative 50 degree weather. I was in negative 55 degree weather in Nebraska. It was insane. And what is pointed out here is that their preservation is limited to a particularly severe hour of trial, which God has in mind. This hour cannot be seen as describing the whole process of tribulation described in the following chapters. This is going to be, it's going to be prolonged. But it has to have a reference to a particularly severe part of the trial which are coming, which they will escape. How many in here has ever heard a pastor teach the great tribulation? How many in here has been taught a great tribulation?
Anybody? What's the great tribulation? I want you to go back to John chapter 17. Okay. What was our Lord Jesus' prayer to our Heavenly Father for us in John 17? Everybody always says, Our Father who art in heaven is the Lord's prayer, but this is the Lord's prayer in John chapter 17, okay? So go back to John chapter 17, and we're going to pick it up in 6, in verse 6. It says, I have manifested your name to the men whom you have given me out of the world. They were yours. You gave them to me, and they have kept your word. Now they have known that all things which you have given me are from you. For I have given to them the words which you get, have given me, and they have received them, and have known surely that I came forth from you, and they have believed that you sent me. I pray for them. I do not pray for the world, but for those whom you have given me, for they are yours. And all mine are yours, and yours are mine, and I am glorified in them. Now I am no longer in the world. But these are in the world, and I come to you, Holy Father, keep through your name those whom you have given me, that they may be one as we are. While I was with them in the world, I kept them in your name, those whom you gave me I have kept, and none of them is lost except the son of perdition, that the scripture might be fulfilled. But now I come to you, and these things I speak in the world, that you may have my joy fulfilled in themselves. I have given them your word. And the world has hated them because they are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. I do not pray that you should take them out of the world, but that you should keep them from the evil one. They are not of the world, just as I am not of the world. Sanctify them by your truth. The word is truth. As you sent me into this world, I also have sent them into the world. And for their sakes, I sanctify myself that they also may be sanctified by truth. A good way to analyze how our God is going to take care of us if we're around during this terrible time of Satan's wrath, as in Daniel chapter 12, points out is learned from how our great and wonderful Lord protected the Israelites who were in Egypt. Does anybody remember Exodus? Does anybody remember Exodus? Now, I believe in the pre-trib uh, rapture, okay? But a lot of people think that they're going to be here and that they're going to be protected according to what how God protected the Israelites. Okay, in Exodus chapter 11, okay? And you're sorry, but he prayed not only for himself, he prayed for his disciples and he prayed for us. Go read John chapter 17. It's a prayer for all three. It's not just for the disciples. Exodus chapter 11, starting at verse 21, it says, Then said the Lord to Moses, Stretch out your hand towards heaven, and there may be darkness over the land of Egypt, darkness which may be even felt. So Moses stretched out his hand toward heaven and there was a thick darkness in the land of Egypt three days. They did not see one another, nor did anyone rise from this place for three days. But all the children of Israel had light in their dwellings. Do you see how our majestic creator controls all things? Notice what our Lord said for us to remember. He said, I come quickly, hold fast what you have that no man may take your crown. Do you remember when he said that here? He said, hold fast to what you have that no man may take your crown. Now, I did a teaching on the crowns uh, about a month and a half ago. And our holy, holy ruler, Lord Jesus, intends that his people live in expectancy of his imminent return. Because he knows it will be an encouragement in whatever they have to face. We should live in expectancy that he might come back today. And plan as that thought. Plan as that thought. Because a lot of people are planning and expecting for him to return, but they're not expecting it today. They're expecting it sometime in the future. I expect his return today so that I am on my game every single day because we don't know when he's going to return. Amen. There's many Christians still looking for his imminent return. Praise God. As have Christians in every age, to every generation, he's coming soon. The 2,000 years that have passed may seem long to us, but in God's terminology, those are only two days. And we're taught that in the book of 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 8. It says that for those who have been faithful, a crown awaits. Who wants a crown? Come on, who wants a crown? I want a crown. Actually, I want seven crowns because that's how many crowns we can earn. We can earn up to seven crowns, and they're listed throughout Scripture. I know I want them. 
And even though I'm going to cast them back at the feet of Jesus, I still want to obtain them because that means that I did my will and my purpose here on the earth. Amen. I received a word. I received a reward for the work that the Holy Spirit did through me, but I earned them by being obedient unto Christ. Amen. That's your reward that you get at the Bema seat. I want them all, but I want to be able to cast them back at the feet of Jesus, which we're going to do. And we're going to see that in the book of Revelation. It says, for those who have been faithful, a crown awaits. There's a couple of crowns promised to believers. Amen. Look at 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 25. Because in 1 Corinthians 9, 25, it talks about the incorruptible crown. And everyone who competes for the prize is temperate in all things. Now they do it to obtain a perishable crown, but we for an imperishable crown... A crown won by striving in accordance with what? With the rules. Amen. So we get this imperishable crown by what? Striving in accordance with his laws and his statutes. And this is a crown that we can receive. Amen. What about 2 Timothy 4, 8? What about 2 Timothy 4, 8? Because it talks about the crown of righteousness. The crown of righteousness says, finally, there is laid up for me the crown of righteousness, which the Lord, the righteous judge will give to me on that day and not to me only, but also to what? How do you get this crown of righteousness? It says to all who have loved his appearing, you are watching, you are waiting, and you are anticipating his return and you're rejoicing for it. Amen. That's how you're going to get this crown of right, of righteousness to all who have loved his appearing. Come on, this is exciting news here, guys. What about James chapter 1, verse 12, where it talks about a crown of life? It says, blessed is the man who endures temptation. I tell people all the time, you should rejoice in your temptation, rejoice in your trial, rejoice in your struggle, rejoice in your situation. Why? Because blessed is the man who endures it. For when he was, has been approved, what? He will receive the crown of life, which the Lord has promised to those who love him. You rejoice in him. You rejoice in your situations. You rejoice in your trials and your struggles. And because you love him, you're going to get the crown of life. Amen. What about first Peter five and four? where it talks about an unfading crown of glory. It says, and when the chief shepherd appears, you will receive the crown of glory that does not fade away. Right now, you're gonna re- you don't have that glory. You have the glory of the Holy Spirit inside of you. But when he reappears, the corruptible will put on the uncorruptible and you'll be as he is. You're going to receive that glory. That crown of glory is the righteousness of God that will be displayed in all the believers. Come on, give him some praise. Give him some praise because this is amazing. It says it does not fade away, meaning it can't be taken. It means that it's never going to go dull. It's never going to run out of oil. It's never going to lose its light. It's always going to be illuminated. It's not going to fade. You might be thinking, if you dress up, which crown will you wind up wearing? They're going to all be put together, one crown on top of the other crown. And if you look up the crown, which the popes wear, you're going to see an example of this type of crown. It says, he who overcomes, I will make him a pillar in the temple of my God. And he will leave it no more. And I will write on him the name of my God and the name of the city of my God, the new Jerusalem, what? Which comes down from heaven from my God and my own new name. Does anybody in here have ID tags where they work? Does anybody in here have ID tags? Maybe it's a name tag. Maybe it's a a badge with your name and your picture and you, you have to scan it to get indoors. You have to show it to get in. Does anybody have a name tag? Look here. You want to pass the entry police angels? Then you better have on the proper ID. 
Come on. If you want to get past the entry, the police angels, you better have the proper ID because we will be clearly identified as his. He will write on us all the name of God to show that we are his and the name of the new Jerusalem, which is going to descend from heaven to show that we belong there. Isn't that exciting that he's going to write his name on us? Your name doesn't matter anymore. Remember, you're going to see in the book of Revelation, we're given a new name. But here, we're given his name. His name is written upon those that have saved, that are sanctified, that are delivered, and that are going to be glorified. You're going to receive his name written upon you. And the new Jerusalem that is lowered is for you. That is your reward. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. He says, he who has an ear, let him hear what the Spirit is saying to the churches. And once again, Jesus tells us, he who has an ear, to let him hear. There's a constant repetition here. And this constant repetition demonstrates how important and urgent it is. How's your hearing? Come on, how's your hearing this morning or this afternoon? How's your hearing Are you hearing what the Spirit is saying to the churches? Are you responding to what the Spirit is saying to the churches? How's your hearing today? Let's go on and move on to the church that makes God sick. We come to the last of the letters to the seven churches now. The letter to the church of Laodicea. The church that made the Lord Jesus Christ sick. The lukewarm church. Do you think that there's some churches today that also make our holy king and master want to throw up? Let's just be honest. I do. And sadly, I'm going to say that there are quite a few in existence that fit this mold. These letters, these letters, as you know, are directed at seven churches, actual churches and historical churches and actual cities in Asia Minor. But they transcend their time and space and they have become model letters to various kinds of churches that exist in all eras of church history. They illustrate for us the character of churches in our own day. In fact, since Pentecost and Laodicea is the last is the worst, five churches with serious problems have already been addressed and they are on somewhat of a descending scale. And as you move through the seven letters, remember two of them had no condemnation. That was Smyrna and Philadelphia. The other five progressively degenerate. They degenerate. There was Ephesus. The church still strands strong doctrinally. But the church that left its first love. There was Pergamos, which had not denied their faith, but was tolerating sin. There was Thyatira, where there was still some good things going on, but full-blown compromise with evil had taken place, and the majority seemed to have been involved. Then there was Sardis, a church with only a few genuine believers, a church which had a name but was actually dead. And now at the bottom of it all, if you will, is Laodicea. This is an unsaved church. In fact, if there were any believers in this church, they aren't even referred to in the letter at all. People want to say, well, we represent the church of Laodicea. No, if you represent the church of Laodicea, you're an unbeliever. This is an unbelieving church. There's nothing in this letter that shows this was a church of believers. Come on. You've got to really study this to see this. It's a church that is characterized by a condition that our Lord described as being lukewarm, which is a metaphor of having all non-saved people. Laodicea has the grim distinction of being among all seven letters, the only one in which our precious Lord Jesus Christ has nothing good to say. It's unmitigated condemnation. There is in this church apparently absolutely no redeeming feature. This is the unsaved, the unregenerate false church. Because of the nature of this church, this is the most threatening epistle. This is the most blistering rebuke, and it's sent to a proud church. 
We, I've mentioned that in addition to these seven churches actually existing, but that those letters also represent church age history. I'm going to give you that breakdown because Ephesus is talking about the years 31 to 135 AD. Smyrna is talking about 135 to 300 AD. Pergamos is talking about 300 to 538 AD. Thyatira is talking about 538 to 1798. Sardis is talking from 1798 to 1929. Philadelphia is 1929 to 1999. Laodicea, 1999 to the return of our Lord and Savior, Jesus Christ. Folks, we're now living in the last days. I don't care what anybody tells you. We're there. How long will it be till our Holy Lord and Savior returns? We don't know, but know that we're in the last days. Amen. The city of Laodicea was located in the Lycus River Valley, the southwest area of Phygeria. Okay. Of the seven cities in the letter, this is the most southeasterly. It is a 45 miles southeast of Philadelphia and would be about directly east of Ephesus, about 100 miles. Laodicea became a very important city and founded by Antioch, uh, Antichius II in the 3rd century BC and he named it for his wife. Crucial to this city was its water supply. There were some local streams in the area, but as the population grew and developed, the local streams and rivers were inadequate and in some fact, and some of them dried up in the winter and so water had to be brought in. And the only way to do this was to bring in by an underground aqueduct. Does anybody know what an aqueduct is? Because an aqueduct is, is literally like a stone pipe or a stone pipeway. What we have now is, is, is iron pipeways. We have what lead pipeways. We have copper pipeways. If you look at the plumbing in your house, you probably got a PVC piping that runs your water here this would have been an aqueduct right would made out of rocks so the water would be flowing in through these aqueducts underground and being very enterprising they managed to build an aqueduct and the water flowed down this aqueduct into the city of laodicea in the u.s we run across cities like this right new york city runs pipes to the delaware water gap to provide for its citizens you guys, you guys know that? You would think that the Hudson next to the five boroughs would be adequate enough, but it's so polluted that this isn't even considered. A second key feature that's going to come into play in the letter that dominates the city is the commercial aspect. There's several things you need to know about the commercial aspect of the city. First of all, this was a huge banking center. It was very wealthy, and apparently it was on the crossroads, the north, the south, the east, and the west. So it became what? A big business hub. And it became a banking center for people moving in all directions to put their funds in. They became very, very wealthy. That when in 60 AD, the city was totally flattened by an earthquake, Rome offered to give them some money to rebuild, and they refused it, saying they had plenty of their own. The people of Laodicea prided themselves on rejecting the offer of financial help from Rome. And they rebuilt the city far more beautiful than it had ever been. And they did it with their own funds. A second feature in the commercial area had to do with the wool industry. Laodicea, Laodicea became famous for its wool industry and the major product, this is very interesting, was a soft wool that was a glossy black in color. Shiny black. It was used for clothing. It was used also for weaving into carpets, both locally and after export. The fourth, the third key feature about this city is a commercial sense. It was a medical school. It had about 13 miles north of the city, a very famous medical school, and it was basically established in connection with an ancient temple that was associated with the god identified later by the name of Asclepius, the god of healing, who is still around in old medical literature. The medical school had famous teachers, but the thing that was most prominent in the medical school was they developed a certain salve for the eyes. 
And people from all over that part of the world, when they had an eye ailment, would come to this medical school near Laodicea to get this eye salve that would then be put on their eyes, which would bring some measure of comfort and healing to the eyes. Look what it says. It says, and to the angel of the church of Laodiceans write, these things say the amen, the faithful and true witness, the beginning of the creation of God. What did he do here? What did Jesus do here? Jesus introduced himself to the church as what? As the amen, the faithful and true witness, the ruler of God's creation. These titles were not taken from the description of Adonai Yeshua in chapter 1. Neither do they have any parallel in the final chapters. However, the idea and the names are implicit to the book of Revelation as a whole. Amen. It says, and to the angel. That's the messenger, the one who was to deliver the letter. The word angel, angelos, be an angel or messenger. That was the seventh of the messengers that had received these letters. And as they moved from city to city, each one would arrive at his own church with a letter for that church. And we don't know whether each of them had a copy of the whole, whole of the apocalypse, the whole of the revelation, but we do know that each one would have a copy of the letter specifically for their own church. Amen. The amen here is a unique title. The prophet Isaiah listed in his book in chapter 65, verse 16, he said, the God of amen. That's Hebrew for truth or affirmation or certainty. God was called the God of truth then, the God of certainty, the God of affirmation. Whatever God says is so. Whatever God says is true and whatever God says is certain. Therefore, he is the God of amen. Sometimes you see it at the very end of a verse. It's used to seal the certainty of what has been said. Amen means firm, fixed, certain, faithfulness, unchangeable. Those are all words that surround the meaning of amen. How is our God and ruler Messiah here the amen? Well, I could say that he's the amen in the sense that he's God. If God is the Old Testament, amen, certainly our Lord Jesus Christ being God in human flesh is the New Testament, amen. Anybody got a problem with that? Because if you do, you don't understand who Jesus is, amen. But there's more to it than just the reference to deity. Because he could have chosen a number of things to refer, him, refer to himself as God. But choosing the amen takes it a step further. He is the amen because he's true. He is the amen because he is certain. But more than that, more specifically, even that general information, Scripture tells us in 2 Corinthians chapter 1, verse 20, a very important truth. It says, for all the promises of God in him are amen. What does this mean? It means that all God's promises and all God's covenants are guaranteed and affirmed by the person and the work of the Son of God, our Lord Jesus Christ. In the Old Testament, God said, I will forgive your sins. God could never do that if it were not for the person and work of Christ, right? Because forgiveness was purchased by his atoning death. All of the promises that God made to take men and show them mercy and loving kindness, grace, and give them a kingdom and a hope and an eternal life are bound up in who? In Jesus Christ fulfilling his work. So that everything that God ever planned or purposed for man, everything that God ever promised for man's finds, it's amen in Jesus Christ. God's promises are all certain in one person, and that person is Jesus Christ. They all become sure in him. So Jesus says, I am the great amen. Amen. He's one who confirmed all the promises. Come on. Are you guys with me or are you asleep? This is amazing. Then he identifies himself as what? The faithful and true witness. This, this further elucidates the same line of thinking as the word amen. So amen had a reference to truth and certainty, and he follows that up by saying he is the faithful and true witness. Not 
only is our Lord Jesus by his work, the amen, or the one who makes the promises of God certain, but every time he speaks, what he says is also true. What he did puts the amen to punctuate the promises of God. What he says is always true. He is faithful and a true witness. He's completely trustworthy. He is per perfectly accurate. His testimony never fails to be reliable. In fact, in the gospel of John, chapter 14, verse 6, he said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. He is, of course, the perfect true witness. Amen. What about in John chapter 3, verse 31? What does he say? He says, he who comes from above is above all. He who is of the earth is from the earth and speaks of the earth. He who comes from heaven is above all, speaking of himself. What he has seen and heard of what he bears witness and no man receives his witness. He who has received his witness has set his seal to this, that God is true. There's something very important for you to think about. Our Lord Jesus comes. He speaks, yet some men reject him. But whoever accepts what he says is saying God is true. He is the amen of God. He is a faithful, true witness who speaks the very word of God. He is in living verification and confirmation of the promises of God in everything he does. And he affirms the truth of God in everything he says. He is absolutely true. And this is the perfect way for Jesus to address this church, to begin this letter, because it affirms to the people in Laodicea that he knows what he's talking about. That whatever assessment he gives of the church is absolutely accurate. That whatever promises he offers the church is absolutely affirmed in his perfect work. And when he rightly assesses their unredeemed condition, he is a faithful and true witness to the condition. And when he offers them the promise of fellowship in verse 20, which is a promise of salvation, he can offer that because he is the amen who seals the covenant of God, the promise of God. Come on, give him some praise. Come on this afternoon. Whew. He says, I know your works. That you're neither cold nor hot. I could wish you were cold or hot. So then because you were lukewarm and neither cold nor hot, I will vomit you out of my stomach or out of my mouth. In each of the letters to the churches, we've also come to a fourth point, the condemnation. However, there is no condemnation here. So there's nothing to say. Verse 15, he says, I know your deeds, period. And I've got no comment. There isn't anything to say to commend anything you do. Do you guys catch that? Go back to all the churches that we've already studied. He always gave them commendation. He gave them encouragement. He gave them and said that he was proud of what something they had done. Here, he says, I know your deeds. There ain't nothing. I ain't got no comment for you. There isn't anything to say to commend anything you do. You've not done anything right. And the condemnation is very important. Look at 15 and 16. He says, I know your deeds, that you're neither cold nor hot. I would prefer that you were cold or hot. So because you're lukewarm and neither hot nor cold, I will spew you or spit you out of my mouth. The King James says, vomit. That's some strong language if you ask me. He says, I know your deeds. He's saying, I know them intimately and I know them infallibly. I know your deeds. Deeds always reveal what a person is and it always works. Remember what Romans 2 verses 6 and 8 says, by their fruit you shall know them, right? Paul makes it clear as anywhere in the Bible, God will judge you on the basis of your deeds. God will render to every man according to his deeds. To those who, by perseverance and doing good, seek for glory and honor and immortality, he'll give eternal life. To those who are selfishly ambitious and don't obey the truth but obey unrighteousness, he will bring wrath and indignation. So he says, I know your deeds, and therefore I know your heart. I can see by what you do what you are. 
This is very important statement with sweeping implications in the New Testament. A person who is a Christian. I'm so tired of people walking around proclaiming to be Christians because a person who is a Christian manifests Christianity. A person who is not does not manifest Christianity. If you just watch them, you can tell if they're born again. I don't care if you say you're a Christian. I want to see your walk match your talk. Your actions speak louder than your words. There's many Bible students that misunderstand this idea. It doesn't mean that the Laodiceans were only semi-spiritual, half and half, and that he would prefer them to even be unspiritual. The idea was rather that because they were like lukewarm water, they were useless for anything and could only make people vomit. Cold water had its uses and hot water had its uses, but lukewarm water had none. It just made men sick and so did them. They were self-satisfied, complacent, and unresponsive. They were so self-important that they felt they were doing enough when in reality, they were doing nothing of real importance at all. Nothing that counted. They were lacking in every way, but were so proud that they did not realize their own inadequacy. There's no mention of their love for Jesus. There's no mention of their love for the majestic Lord or of their faith or of their endurance or by their works. They did not get involved at all. Jesus was wishing that they had some value like cold water for drinking or hot water for bathing. A lukewarm, useless Christian who can only make people sick is a contradiction in terms. This is not speaking to a believing church. I'm so tired of pastors teaching that this was talking to a believing church because it's not. It's a contradiction. We have to take note in the statement, the most relentless, overpowering rebuke yet. And the rebuke says, basically, I'm going to spit you out of my mouth because you're lukewarm. This takes us back to our comment about the water supply in Hierapolis, six miles to the north. There was some famous springs, hot springs, in fact. They were one of the most well-known and popular places for healing. The water was hot, and when you went there and sat in the water, and it had therapeutic power, and it's still used today. Heropolis had hot water, and that hot water was therapeutic. In Colossus, 10 miles south and east, there was a cold stream. We learned that the stream was perennially running and perennially cold, like typically typical water that was flows from the high mountains. The water was thirst-quenching. That water was famous because of its cool, clear character. They didn't have the hot therapeutic water of Heropolis and they didn't have the cold, clear, freshing water of Colos. They had the foul, dirty, tepid water that flowed for miles through an underground aqueduct. It was hot and it wasn't cold, not had not hot enough to relax and restore, not cool enough to refresh and quench. Laodicea couldn't provide the refreshment of Colos. It couldn't provide the healing of Heropolis. Its lukewarm water was absolutely useless. And any visitor who came there who wasn't used to the stuff would put it in his mouth and immediately begin to vomit. The, Luke, the word lukewarm here in Greek is chilaros and it's simply a word for tepid water. The water supply of Laodosa was derived from an artificial pipeline bringing water which was literally lukewarm and so impure as to have a regurgitating effect. You're probably thinking, well, what's the spiritual significance of this? It's simply that the Laodicean church made Christ vomit. It was a sickening church. Some churches make the Lord weep. Some churches make the Lord angry. This one made him sick. Back in chapter 2 and also in chapter 3, we saw his anger towards some churches. We've seen it with Pergamos, Thyatira, Sardis, but here he's sick. Now, how are we to interpret these three categories? What does cold mean? That's not too tough. Cold means spiritually cold. Open, outright rejection of Jesus Christ. 
rejecting the gospel. He says, you're not cold. I mean, you're just not openly outright rebellious, rejecting Christ and rep, rep, uh, repudiating Christianity. But what does hot mean? Hot means zealous, spiritually alive and awake and eager and fired up as it were for the Lord. He says, you're not that either. You're not boiling for with spiritual zeal for the Lord, nor are you openly outright cold. There are many in the world that are completely cold to the things of Christ. The gospel leaves them absolutely unmoved. It arouses no spiritual response. They have no interest in Christianity, no interest in the church. They make no pretense. They certainly aren't hypocrites. They don't even go near things that have to do with Jesus. They are lost and they could care less. They don't want to hear the word of God at all. On the other hand, believers are marked by a response to a spiritual truth and they're zealous and they're fervent. They're hot. And he's saying metaphorically, I can take it if you were like Heropolis because then you'll be real. I could even take it if you were like the cold water of Coloss. That's better than being the foul water of Laodicea, lukewarm. Who are they? Professing Christians, go to church, claim to know the Lord, but aren't saved. This is not a saved church. I don't care what any pastor tries to tell you. This is not a saved church. They're content with self-righteous religion. They're hypocrites playing games. They're playing church. They're the kind of people described in Matthew 7, where our Lord Jesus says, many will say unto me in that day, Lord, Lord, and I will say unto them, depart from me. I never knew you. You have done many works in my name and prophesied and cast out demons but I don't know you. I don't know you. You're going to hear pastors say, well, those are believers that did that. No, those are unbelievers. They're the ones playing church. See, a lot of pastors and a lot of teachers don't want to study and they don't want to understand that even the Antichrist will perform miracles. Even the devil will perform miracles. The, the people of that category will be able to declare and perform miracles in ways to bring not glory to God, but glory to themselves. We've got to study the word. We've got to know the word. We've got to know what Christ is telling us. Amen. What does it say in 2 Timothy 3, 5? It backs up exactly what I just said. Who have a form of godliness, but without power. They're like the Jews in Romans chapter 10 who have zeal for God, but not according to a true knowledge. They're just hypocrites touched some way by Christianity, but not belonging to Christ. And there's something obnoxious about them. They nauseate Christ. They make him sick. Are you guys with me? Look what it says in 17. It says, because you say I am rich, I have become wealthy and have need of nothing. And do not know that you are wretched, miserable, poor, blind, and naked. I counsel you to buy from me gold refined in the fire that you may be rich and white garments that you may be clothed that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed and anoint your eyes with eye salve that, that you may see. We read here that they, even there's something worse than being lukewarm and that was their self-deception. Look at 17. It says, here's the second condemnation. Because you say I'm rich and have become wealthy and have need for nothing, and you do not know that you are wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. Look at the first part of that, because you say. Go back to Matthew chapter 7, because if you go back to Matthew chapter 7, and you go back to my teaching on Matthew 7, I talked about if we sayers, and the if we doers, if we say, if we say, if we say what our Lord Jesus said doesn't mean anything. What matters is if we do, if we do, if we do what the Lord says. It's not the people who say what the Lord says, it's the people who do the will of my Father. Come on, it's the one that does the will of my Father. What is the will of his Father? To believe on the one that he has sent. You see this in John chapter 6. You have to be a doer of the will of the Father. Laodicea was a very wealthy city. It had material wealth. It gave its people a false security. They were famous for that wealth. And apparently the church thought it was wealthy too. You say, where are they talking about money here, Pastor. I don't really think they are or were talking about money. I think they thought they were rich in spiritual reality. I think they thought they had spiritual riches. 
Let me go a step further. I think the heresy in Colos was a form of incipient Gnosticism, a sort of a preview to what later became known as Gnosticism. And Gnosticism comes from the word gnosis, which means to know. In other words, there were people who believed that they had attained to to the ascended knowledge that Christ was not enough for them. They had gone beyond Christ. Christ was just an emanation from God, an angelic being on a descending ladder of beings that go from good to bad, and he was somewhere up in the good category. This is where this teaching comes, that we are little gods. Come on. The Gnostics say, but we have ascended beyond the simplicity of Christ. Christ is only a part. He's only a component. We have reached the ascended knowledge. We have gone beyond that. Isn't this what the, uh, the, ser- the serpent told Eve? You will be like God. You will have all knowledge of all things. Isn't this the same thing that he told Eve in the garden? Why do you think Paul in Colossians chapter 2 so explicitly says of Christ in him are hidden all the treasures of wisdom and knowledge and you are complete in him and don't you let anybody spoil you through philosophy and empty deceit and think there's something more elevated than Jesus Christ. That same heresy has found its way over here. People are saying we are the ascended ones. If this isn't the typical hypocritical liberal line directed at believers, you mindless fundamentalist. All of you people who just believe the simplicity of the Bible are not educated. You're not up to speed. You haven't obtained to the ascendant knowledge. You are anti-intellectual. I'm calling you out. I'm calling you out. They had spiritual pride. They were rich. They had become spiritually wealthy. They had attained the ascended knowledge. They had gone past the simple belief about Jesus that these uneducated and non-trained Christians believe. They think they're spiritually rich, so they said, I am rich. That's their state. And they become wealthy. That's the process to that state. They did it by themselves. I'm rich, and guess who got me there? Me. And I have need of nothing. That's a self-righteous work system, isn't it? Saying, I've attained it all. I've reached an elevated level. This is the hardest person to reach. If you've ever done street ministry, this is the hardest person to reach. The intellectual apostate. The intellectual unsaved hypocrite who stays in the church. Liberal churches flood our country. They have an aberrant view of Christ. They see him not as the creator God. They have an infatuation with their own intellect and assume that they have been elevated beyond the simplicity of fundamental truth. They've developed a self-righteous work system that makes them think they are spiritually elite who need absolutely nothing. And when you come with the simple gospel, they laugh at you. Look at the oneness group. Let's call them out today. Look at the oneness heresy. They believe they have knowledge that no one else has. And if you bring them the simple gospel, they reject it. They laugh and they begin to ridicule you. We see it clearly. The lukewarm condition is being lost. It's the sickening condition of thinking you are spiritually rich when you're bankrupt, of thinking you are beautiful when you're wretched, of imagining you are to be envied when you are to be pitied, of believing you see clearly everything when you see nothing. You are stone blind. A feeling you are clothed in spiritual finery and you are stark naked. That's what he's saying. You've got it exactly opposite. You may have a bank account in the spiritual bank. You may be wearing the shiny black wool. You may have the eye salve, but you're poor and you are poor and you are blind and you are naked. This is a person to be pitied. That's what it means. Miserable and wretched. You have no riches. You have no clothes. You have no vision. You have no sight. You're spiritually naked, spiritually blind and spiritually bankrupt. 
Verse 18 gives us the command. This is fascinating. Listen to this command. He says, I advise you to buy from me gold refined by fire that you may become rich in white garments that you may clothe yourself and that the shame of your nakedness may not be revealed in eye salve that you may anoint your eyes that you may see. Woo! Now you see how the industry of the city comes into play. And I advise you, I'm giving you some counsel. Isn't the Lord gracious? If you believe the Lord's gracious today, type it in the chat because the Lord is gracious. He says, you make me sick, but my gospel compels me to give you an invitation. You make me sick, but my promise compels me to give you an invitation. You make me sick, but I still have to offer you salvation. I still have to offer it to you because it was a promise that I made. He could have turned them into cinders by the breath of his mouth. But it's an invitation to a church full of hypocrites. And it reminds me that they still are worthy of an invitation, are they not? From a gracious God, he says, you need to buy from me. You need to buy from me. You're saying, now, wait a minute, pastor. What do you mean buy? What do you mean buy? Because we can't buy our salvation. We can't buy these things. It's the same kind of buy in Isaiah 55 verse 1. You remember that wonderful chapter, which is an evangelistic appeal in Isaiah 55 1. Let me just read to read it to you. So you'll have it exactly as it's written. The call of God to the unregenerate sounds like this. Oh, everyone who thirsts come to the waters. You who have no money come buy and eat. Did you get that? You who have no money, come buy and eat. So this is a kind of thing you can buy when you don't have anything. You come and buy it. You say, now wait a minute. If I don't have anything, what do I buy it with? Are you ready for this? The only thing you have is what? Your own wretched condition. So that's all you can offer. You can only bring your sinful self into the presence of God and buy his water and buy his food and buy his salvation because you recognize that you can't do it on your own, but that you need a savior to do it. Hallelujah. Come on. You've got to recognize this today. You've got to recognize this today by recognizing the condition, your wretched self. You can come to him and purchase the water. You can purchase the linen. You can purchase the eye salve. You can purchase these things. That's what he's telling the church here. He's saying, you don't have to have any money. Just bring your wretched self and admit that you need a savior. So you come and you say, I'll give you me for you. Is that a deal? And our Lord Jesus said that, what will a man give in exchange for his soul? What shall it profit a man if he gains the whole world and he gave that in exchange for his soul? No, what can you give in exchange for your soul? Only yourself. That's what repentance is. And repentance means I renounce myself. I yield myself. I give myself to you, Lord. That's what repentance is. And he says, I want you to buy three things. You give yourself to me, that's the price. All that you are, right, for all that I am. And first of all, I'll give you gold refined by fire that you may become rich. Pure gold refined by fire. No impurities. See, they thought they were rich in spiritual truth. They thought they were rich in spiritual reality. They thought they were transcendent. You know, they were bankrupt. He says, I'll give you spiritual gold. I'll give you the spiritual riches. I'll give you what is pure and what is valuable and and what is priceless. I'll endow you with such spiritual riches you never dreamed of. I'll give you a true and tested faith. Let me give you an awesome verse. 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 7 says, the proof of your faith is more precious than gold. Ooh, the, the, the proof of your faith is more precious than gold. What is the gold he's talking about? I think a real faith, a true faith. He says, your faith is more precious than gold. Then he says, buy white garments that you may clothe yourself. Get rid of those black ones. Get a white one. Back in Isaiah 61, 10, Isaiah said that God wants to clothe us with the robe of his righteousness. We know in chapter 3 of Revelation, verse 4, he said that people who walk with the Lord will walk with him in white, for they are worthy. 
Over in Revelation chapter 7 verse 9, you see the same multitude and they are in white robes. And over in chapter 19 verse 8, it says that she is clothed in fine linen, white or bright and clean. And this fine linen is the righteousness of the saints. So he says, I'll give you a true faith. I'll give you a pure faith, a saving faith, a confident faith. And then I will give you righteousness. I will give you a righteous nature and I will give you righteous acts. Come on, give him some praise. Then he says, I want you to get some eye salve to anoint your eyes so you can really see. You know what they used to do? There was some kind of a powder that they found. It's called in, in some history books, the, 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 the Phrygian powder. And they knew if they placed it on the eye, it had a very soothing effect, a therapeutic effect, actually a medicinal effect. And so what they would do is they would put that powder in some coarse dough and then they would place the coarse dough on the eyes and somehow they would seal it so it remained there for a length of time. It brought healing and restoration of the eyes. And he says, in, in effect, you think you see, but you don't see. But if you come to me, I'll give you eye salve and you'll see. You see, salvation is the gold that makes people spiritually rich in faith. Salvation is the white robe that covers our sinful nakedness. Salvation is the eye salve that gives us the knowledge of God and of his truth. What's he offering? He's offering an abiding faith, an abiding righteousness, an abiding understanding. He says, you are poor, you are blind, you are naked. He says, but let me fix that. Let me fix that. You can't do it on your own. But if you just come to me in your wretched self, I can fix that. And all that comes together when the sinner offers the price, which is himself. And he re when he repents to follow Jesus Christ. He says in verse 19, he says, and as many as I love, I rebuke and chasten. Therefore, be zealous and repent. The word for love here is philo, meaning great affection. Our great Lord Jesus wishes that the Laodiceans to know that his heart reaches out to them, that his love is not dependent on their de 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 deserts. And as good as the Redeemer says in Isaiah 43, 3, you are precious in my sight and I have loved you. While in Deuteronomy chapter 7, verse 8, Israel are reminded that they were not loved and chosen because of anything in themselves, but because God had set his love upon them. Indeed, he drew them with the cords of a man, with bands of love, which the prophet Hosea tells us in chapter 11, verse 4. His reproof here, his chastening are proof of that love. In the Old Testament, God told his people, and you will consider in your heart that as a man chastens his son, so the Lord God chastens you, and you will keep the commandments of the Lord your God to walk in his ways and fear him. Deuteronomy chapter 8. He says, be zealous, therefore, and repent. This change of heart and mind is only demanded of four churches. One of them because of the heresy in their midst, Pergamum. One because they have lost their first love, Ephesus. And the other two, Sardis and Laodicea, because of their failure of the whole church as a result of their, their, lack, their lack state. Refusal to hear means the lamp standing being removed from its place, Ephesus. An attack with the sword of his mouth against the offenders, Pergamum. The arrival of Jesus as a thief to catch them unprepared by his coming, Sardis. And to the church of Laodicea, he gives similar warning of his coming. He says, Behold, I stand at the door and knock. If anyone hears my voice and opens the door, I will come into him and dine with him and he with me. In Luke chapter 12, verses 35 to 38, Jesus tells his disciples that they must let your loins be girded about the clothes tucked into the girdle to make movement easier and your lamps burning and yourselves like men looking for their Lord when he returns from the marriage feast so that when he comes and knocks, they may immediately open to him. Then he will set them down to supper and come serve them. I want you to see something here. It says, like men looking for their Lord when he returns from the marriage feast. The marriage feast takes place in heaven. That's with the resurrected church. For anybody in here that doesn't believe in a rapture, you just heard Jesus out of his own mouth. It says when he returns from the marriage feast. Who's, who's at the marriage feast if there's no rapture? I don't know, Pastor Nate. 
I don't know. I, I never noticed that in scripture because so many people want to just stand on what their pastor tells them instead of looking in scripture and understanding what God is saying. This is important. This is important. This is a clear reference to that parable, the son of man whom Jesus saw standing among the lampstands. It's pictured as having arrived and is standing and knocking at the door of this church so that he may come in and sup with them. He says, I'm here. He says, I'm knocking. But the interference is that they are not ready to hear. So next, he makes a plea to individuals in the church. If anyone will hear this voice and open the door, I will come in. I will come in to him. Right? He says, I will come in with him. Why is this so hard to understand? Why is this so hard to understand? People are not paying attention to what the Lord is doing. Amen. In other words, he wishes the churches to see him as on the verge of his coming in glory and to respond on that basis. At some stage, he's going to come and no one knows when, so they must be like servants making ready. But he recognizes that they're so complacent that he is doubtful of their response. So then he addresses each individual individual member. He says, if any individual would therefore recognize him as the coming Lord and welcome him, even before his coming, he will sup with them and they with him. This does not really represent the heart's door, but it does refer to an individual's willingness to receive him and welcome him, which is much the same thing. Here in Revelation, a similar promise is made to overcomers. For to share a throne is to participate in the authority of that throne. Thus, they too will reign with him. We've already seen the promises to overcomers are sharing in the heavenly, the heavenly paradise, the heavenly manna, the heavenly temple. So this throne here and this reigning must also be seen as heavenly and not earthly. So when just as when you're interpreting the Old Testament, we must take the spiritual meaning behind the promises and not depress the literal words. The final words of this chapter underline all that has been said. It is up to every man now how he hears. And we have been warned seven times how foolish we would not be to hear. These are not letters to scare you. These are letters to encourage you to get back in right standing with God. To trust in him and only him. That it's him that does it. Amen. Are you willing to hear the words that the Lord has said? Because this is very important to knowing your salvation. 